So, welcome back everybody to this afternoon session. Uh, we'll have two talks. It's a particular pleasure to welcome Cengiz uh, for the first talk. A particular pleasure because uh, you had to jump through quite a few logistic hurdles <laughs> or overcome sure. quite a few logistic challenges to be here, but you made it. And we're very happy about that. And we're looking forward to your talk about uh, deep learning theory at limits, not at its limits yet. Yeah, at limits. So, yeah, thank you, Cengiz. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm Cengiz Pehlevan. I'm, uh, I'm a, I'm a physicist by training. Actually, the last time I was in this room as a, as a graduate student in string theory, I was taking a summer school over here. Since then, I started working on um, theoretical neuroscience. That's what I call myself now. Somehow, I ended up in an applied math uh, department and started working on machine learning, too. But um, so as also I was attending this uh, meeting, my talk got longer and longer because I said, oh, I want to say something about this and something about that. And also, it, it meant it gets shallower and shallower. So. We'll see how this goes. Um, so the first thing I want to actually address is this. So this is a theoretical neuroscience session, and why would a theoretical neuroscientist give a talk on deep learning theory? Now, because your friends might have told you that you know, backdrop is not biologically plausible, so deep learning is not relevant, and so on and so forth. So that, so that statement about backdrop being biologically not plausible by itself is of debate, so we can talk about that later, but I want to give you two motivations. So I'll just give you start with some general motivations not necessarily about, uh, well, it has some connection to the rest of the talk. So the first one is basically coming from uh, this influential paper. So its title is uh, Using Goal-Driven Deep Learning Models to Understand Sensory Cortex. Uh, so this is a review paper about uh, sort of an industry of research that uh, arises in the recent years trying to sort of um, make parallels between backpropagation trained deep neural networks and, um, and, and the brain itself. So, and of course, um, historically, Neural networks themselves are inspired by the brain, their architectural choices, and so on and so forth. There's a long history uh, um, about that. But I mean, the current philosophy is basically summarized in this figure over here. So at top, you're seeing uh, um, the brain in a very cartoonish picture. All, all these uh, things correspond to several areas in the, in the visual cortex. And at bottom, you're seeing a, a convolutional neural network with its, its layers. And the idea, these arrows are basically saying that, okay, maybe these layers are corresponding to this area in the, in, the, in the brain somehow, and the hierarchy of the deep network has to do with the hierarchy of the brain. So the data that backs up is basically here. Again, this is a, this is a figure taken from this paper. So let's look at figure B over here. So what's been happening here is the following. So there's a monkey. The monkey is being shown a, a series of images. And in, in parallel, there's a, a convolutional neural network that was trained on some kind of a classification task. And, um, in, in, and, and the recording is done in an area of the brain called inferior temporal cortex. This is a pretty high individual hierarchy, and neurons here are responsive to, um, I mean, very high level object categories. So the black line over here is corresponding to this neuron's resp response. It's a real uh, biological neuron. So each, you're seeing several example images over here. So basically, there's a bunch of images, and this is the response. And, and, the, and the red curve over here is basically a uh, the response of a neuron, or actually a linear combination of neurons, neural responses, in, the par in a particular hidden area, hidden layer of uh, the convolutional neural network. And you're seeing a basically a very, very good match. So these authors basically went on to quantify the match between this uh, biology and, and artificial neural networks, and they observed a few interesting things. So one of them is summarized here, basically, what it's showing on the y-axis is uh, how well uh, uh, an artificial model can predict responses in the IT cortex. And on the x-axis is basically the performance of a model in a image classification task, an artificial task. So the better you get in the x-axis, you also get better in the y-axis. And, and, uh, and, uh, models that are trained to do good in artificial tasks are also good for uh, explaining the brain. There's also finer level comparisons here. For example, they find that like, um, uh, Earlier layers of the uh, convolutional neural network are better descriptors of earlier layers in the brain, and later layers in of the convolutional neural network is better descriptors of higher areas in the brain. So even though, I mean, you know, the representations here came to be through evolution and maybe learning and development, and the other one is through a backdrop, you know, there seems to be a match between some features of the uh, representations itself. So therefore, one reason for a theoretical neuroscientist to study deep learning is to say something or learn something about the representations of deep learning, and maybe that will shed some light into uh, representations in the brain. Of course, it's much easier to study this. I can simulate this on a computer as opposed to, you know, a monkey which involves, you know, lots of procedures, years of training, and like 
you know, um, things like that. So that's my motivation. And the motiv okay, and this is basically a, a website brain score. This is again uh, hosted by Jim DiCarlo Lab at MIT. And what you're seeing here is basically a list of models, and these models are listed by their um, ability to predict brain activity. And basically, all the models that you're currently seeing are uh, such uh, deep learning models, uh, as opposed to older fashioned models where people are becoming are, are sort of more um, uh, principled about the way they try to explain brain activity. Okay, so that's one reason. So the second reason I want to propose is also there seems to be some um, uh, problems uh, that are common to both study of deep learning and the brain. So one of them is this, this subject that was brought up many times in this, in this uh, workshop, the fact that modern deep neural networks are over-parameterized compared to the um, uh, number of parameters, number of uh, training data that with which they are trained with. Right? So I mean, state of the heart has reached you know, 100 billion parameters. Now, the same could be said about the brain, too. So, you know, uh, our brains have about 20, 10 to the 14 synapses. And um, so here is a, a quote from uh, Jeff Hinton, which was on a Reddit, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> discussion. He said, the brain has about 10 to the 14 synapses, and we only live about 10 to the 9 seconds. So if you were to think of the brain as a parametric model and we're training in a supervised way, we would need about 10 to the 5 data points per second labeled data. So that obviously is not happening. Now, to be fair, Hinton was arguing that this gap could be filled by unsupervised learning. But if you talk to a neurobiologist, they'll say, I mean, things like, well, I mean, it's not even clear that uh, learning is as important as we think to intelligence, right? So, most, so here's a quote from Tony Zaydor, in a, uh, a neurobiologist, in a, in a review article or opinion article he wrote about this. So he says, I mean, uh, most animal behavior is not the result of clever learning algorithms, supervised or unsupervised, but is encoded in the genome. There are many animals uh, which basically function at birth. And of course, we learn during our, our lifetimes, but if you think of any task and the number of examples that you see for that task, uh, the number of parameters, so the number of samples that you see is much smaller than the potential number of synapses that take part into that, in, that, uh, in that computation. So we are even in our learning um, uh, paradigms, we are living in this over-parameterized regime. And other authors also commented into this. So for that reason, I mean, um, all these lessons that are coming from uh, the study of um, deep learning and, and, and um, um, its inductive biases in this over-parameterized regime might have something to do with the brain. So I'll try to show an example of this idea applied to neuroscience today. So this is my depiction of basically this uh, idea of over-parameterization and inductive bias. So this is a Two, depending on how you count this, okay, three-layer neural network with 100 neurons in each layer, so 10,000 parameters. I trained it on a scalar input, scalar output with just two data points. So it's really, really vastly over-parameterized. You know, I threw all of machine learning's optimizers into this, and it ended up, this is a very powerful function approximator. You know, it could fit any crazy, wiggly, high-frequency function of these two points, but it ended up fitting a line um, so there's some kind of an Occam's razor going on among all the explanations that this uh, machine could come up with this data. It, 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 it shows something simple. So one might imagine that these kinds of principles are also what's happening in the brain, and there's strong reliance on inductive biases, and therefore understanding uh, what, what are, what's caused by these, what causes these inductive biases is both important for the brain and, and also study of deep learning. So with these motivations, I mean, I've been looking into deep learning a little bit more. So in particular for this talk, we'll study this simple scenario. Well, this, this scenario, which is not simple, but I mean simple to, I guess, uh, state. So we'll look at a uh, uh, multi-layered uh, uh, feed-forward neural network. I'll have uh, a data set. So X is going to be are the inputs, and Ys are the uh, desired labels. So the way I uh, choose my, um, for me, P is the number of uh, points. So that's the data set. It's the opposite of statistics um, um, convention. And there's going to be some loss. And I'm going to be basically focusing on a gradient flow dynamics. So gradient flow means, of course, that the theta are the parameters of this neural network. We'll update that basically by the negative of the gradient of the um, uh, of the loss with respect to the parameters. Just want to point that, I mean, uh, so there is a uh, similar equation for um, a network's output under gradient flow dynamics. So f of x here basically corresponds to the function that this neural network expresses uh, as a function of x and also the parameters theta. And as, as the parameters are evolving over time, 
of course, we get an expression about how the uh, predictor or the prediction of a neural network changes over time, which is given by this expression. It just follows from simple chain rule. And, um, and then there arises an object here, which is basically, uh, I mean, again, was mentioned a few times during this talk, which is given by this dot product of uh, network's output with respect to the, um, uh, the gradient of network's output with respect to the parameters dotted into itself, evaluated at two different data points, and this is the neural tangent kernel. I'm highlighting this because this will have something important uh, during this talk. Okay, so I mean, this is a differential equation description, so one might imagine ho hopefully we can say something about this differential equation. Of course, I mean, it's deceptively simple because all the complexity of the neural network is basically hidden in this uh, tangent cur kernel, which itself is evolving over time. So how do we study this? Okay, so a uh, well, I mean, you know, uh, a good strategy that theorists have been exploiting for a long time is basically study non-trivial limits and see, see but tractable limits and see if you can gain insight. So that's the, where the title comes from, Deep Learning at Limits. And in particular, I'll talk about three such limits today. Um, well, I was hoping to talk about three such limits, but now it's got longer, so maybe I'll, I'll stick with two. And, um, and also illustrate neuroscience applications of one of these limits. So the first one of these limits is basically the well-studied and influential uh, one of the infinite width limit. So the idea here is the following. So here's some more uh, notation. So I'm going to, phi is going to be uh, my nonlinearity at this moment. Um, and then um, <coughs> basically inputs are cascaded by some affine transformations and nonlinear uh, transformations from one end to the other one. And, um, and what I'll do is basically, um, so this particular limit was basically the following idea. You keep adding more and more uh, neurons at each layer such that they go to infinity. And if you initialize your net network randomly in a particular way, for example, by choosing these weights from a, a normal distribution with uh, zero variance and, uh, sorry, uh, zero mean and variance one, and then also scale your, um, uh, uh, basically the, uh, the inputs to the uh, next layer by one over the square root of the width of that layer to keep the variances sort of uh, order one as the, uh, as the width goes to infinity, you observe, by, by which by now has been proven in many different ways, that basically something very great happens. All this complexity gets reduced to the following thing. So what changed from here to there is basically this object became static, meaning that it doesn't evolve anymore, but it gets uh, fixed at the um, initial condition. And, um, and especially if you're considering a um, loss which is a square loss, right? In that case, this becomes a linear differential equation, then you can solve it and you can study it and you know, life is good. So, so let's do that. Uh, but before doing that, um, let me just illustrate in pictures what happened. So this was the full complexity where all layers are trained. In this particular limit, this gets basically mapped to or changes to this other picture where you take, take some input and map it through some static nonlinearities. These nonlinearities are uh, given by the gradient of the network's output at initialization. And then, again, if you're doing um, um, <coughs> um, uh, square loss, it turns out, I mean, okay, so then, and then, then you combine these features linearly to produce an output, and if you're doing square loss, it turns out that procedure by itself is basically a kernel regression so, a problem where the kernel is given by the uh, dot products of these, these features, and that's, that's, that's the that's the neural tangent kernel machine uh, limit of uh, deep learning. Okay, so now that a lot of, uh, of course, well-known results about this problem, because at the end of the day, this is a linear problem. It's linear in the following sense, right? So you're, you're fitting a linear model, but the linear model itself has features that are nonlinear uh, functions of the input. So it is trivial, but not so trivial. So it gives some insight. So that's what we're gonna talk about. And uh, so our, our particular contribution to this was basically the following. So we took this uh, model and you know, uh, used some machinery from uh, statistical mechanics, which I'm not going to go into the details of, it's in these two papers, and basically came up with a, a, a way to predict the generalization error of this kernel machine in a pretty generic way for any task, so that task can be any target function that this network you're trying to fit, it could, be, it could be anything, and any data distribution. Okay. Of course, this generality comes with a caveat, so all this theory depends on basically um, um, spectral properties of the kernel diagonalized on this distribution. So, and what comes out of this is basically a formula for, you know, given a set, a set of a number of samples, 
and you basically then uh, get the, uh, then you try to say uh, how, how well this model will generalize over a full, full data set. We have a formula that predicts it. The formula looks like this. It's complicated. I'm not going into details of it. It depends on the uh, spectrum of the uh, kernel. What I'll do is I'll try to, you know, point a few uh, of the phenomenologies that this describes in relation to relating it to neuroscience. Okay, so, but there are many other phenomenology that comes out of these equations. Okay, so first let me try to convince you that this actually works. So here are simulations. Uh, let's look at this one first of all. So the uh, solid line is the theory. So this is basically, I'll be evaluating our um, theory or equations, and that's what that equation is. The, um, the triangles are the, uh, so we took basically a number of uh, examples from the MNIST data set, maybe 10, 100, 1,000, and trained this kernel machine, and then, you know, calculated some generalization error. This is all in uh, square loss. And basically, so, so that procedure is basically these uh, triangles. So that's, and, and the error bars are basically averages over different subsamplings of training data sets. And the more interesting thing is basically these, uh, uh, these circles. So these are basically, uh, in this particular case, a three-layer neural network with width 800, not infinite, trained with gradient descent. And, and basically that's, you know, those are those points, how, they, how well they perform. So th this is a statistical mechanical theory in the sense that it's not, it's not upper bound or lower bound. It's supposed to basically describe the data as itself. And, you know, it does pretty well. I mean, we expect this theory to break at some point and we can talk about where that breaks and that's the other two limits I'm gonna talk about. I mean, that's an attempt to get there. But, I mean, for the, there exists a parameter regime which is non-trivial and basically it's a pretty good descriptor. So the other one is basically a slightly more complex data set, CIFAR 10, I mean, this is probably a four layer MLP with 5,000, and it's again the same, the same thing. I believe actually in this particular case, yeah, exactly. Circles are the kernel limit and triangles are the uh, neural network simulation. So, okay, so this net theory is descriptive in some parameter regime, so can we use this to actually say something, some insight, something non-trivial about uh, deep learning? Okay, so the first thing I'm going to focus on is basically this idea of uh, inductive bias, or in, which I'll call spectral bias. I'll call it spectral bias because, I mean, which relates to the fact that neural networks are uh, fitting data with simple functions, which in turn has to do with the spectrum of this kernel, and that goes through the following fact. You can take any kernel and basically uh, diagonalize it under any data distribution, okay? And so this kernel has some eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, so etas are the eigenvalues and phi's are the eigenfunctions in this case, this particular slide. Okay, and the, and the nice thing about uh, this description is, you know, I mean, um, so I, I don't want to go into technical details, but uh, a kernel defines a, a, a functional space, the, the uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space and so on and so forth, and these, uh, these eigenfunctions are constructed basis in that space. So which means basically, roughly speaking again, um, you can think of this neural network in this limit basically uh, at the end of the day, taking these eigenfunctions and linearly combining to produce something. And similarly, you can think of a target function which this neural network is trying to fit, okay? So basically, in this particular limit, the whole problem boils down to figuring out these coefficients, uh, which it depends on, of course, all the network's complexity, which basically uh, maps to the, um, you know, the maps to the true target function. Okay, cool. So why am I bringing this up? Because using these equations, you can prove a few interesting things. The first one is the following. So you can prove that under, again, we're talking about square loss over here. You can prove that there's a spectral bias in the following sense. Uh, the kernel machine tries to fit uh, data sort of in, in an ordering of these, uh, these eigen uh, spaces. It will try to first fit the data in the space corresponding to the first eigenfunction, and then this, and then this, and so on and so forth. The mathematical statement is this one here. So we can basically uh, um, form these relative errors. So this is the neural network's weight, learned weight. This is the, t the true weight. This is the relative error. And you find that basically the generalization error uh, for um, uh, a particular mode is smaller for any data set size given that the, uh, uh, the eigenvalue corresponding to that uh, eigenfunction is larger, okay? So I call this spectral bias. There's an ordering of uh, functions. Okay, and f using that, you can uh, basically uh, formulate a metric which I call cumulative power, C of K. This is basically take any target function and um, add its sort of coefficients up to some value K, and, and if this 
power is a, it's a vector metric. If this is rising very fast, that means that model, that, that function is very uh, easy for this, uh, uh, for this uh, model to learn. And if that uh, metric is rising uh, slowly, then actually there is no good alignment, meaning that this network is not going to be learned this function, function very well in a sample efficient manner. Okay, so, so, so let's, uh, here's an example of this fact. So these are basically, um, um, this is a target function that's composed. So it's a very special case where we can actually analytically solve the whole eigenspectrum of the kernel under this data distribution and actually come up with even more interesting statements. So roughly what's happening here is the data is sampled in a high dimension over a high dimensional sphere uniformly. You can show that the uh, kernel's eigen uh, functions in this uh, particular case are um, um, spherical harmonics. And now you can consider target functions which have only a particular type of spherical harmonic content. Now it says YKMs are spherical harmonics, and I always forget one of them is degree and one of them is order, so I'll just say K. K is the first index. Uh, so you can have fun target functions which have only a certain K index. So this K is basically like a frequency. K goes higher, it means these are more and more complex functions. And you can prove that basically, or show that, in, again, uh, in, a, in, this, in this limit, um, it will take about, D, D being the dimensionality of data, D to the power K samples to be able to learn this target function. Meaning that if you, were, if you had a function that has only, let's say, K equal to seven content, in this particular case, we have 15 uh, dimensions, you'll need about 15 to the power seven data set, uh, size data set to be able to even see a reduction in uh, generalization error. So that's basically what this is showing. Each line here is a different target function with a different sort of uh, con K content. And you see that if you have a K1 function, the generalization error curve basically starts falling only after 15 samples. But for this guy over here, which has K with four content, you need about 15 to the four samples to start falling. So this basically is illustrating something about the inductive bias of neural networks in the sense that, you know, it's easy, well, if you know what you're looking for, it's easy to fool them, basically generate uh, tasks for which these are actually not very data efficient. Okay, so this particular insight, now we're gonna take this uh, from this domain and try to say something about the brain. And in particular, we're gonna look at this data. So this is uh, a data coming from this uh, article by Stringer and, and colleagues. And what, what the authors did here was basically took a mouse and then looked at its uh, uh, primary visual cortex, recorded about from about 10,000 to 20,000 neurons through some imaging technique, and showed this uh, animal many, many different images, including images from the ImageNet data set, okay? And uh, so what we're gonna do is basically we're gonna treat this um, <coughs> data as fellows. We're gonna think of basically a bunch of, a population of neurons, so we're gonna forget about everything that comes before it, and we'll think of this population as a static uh, population. And then uh, try to uh, train a readout uh, 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 from this, this population uh, using some kind of uh, a delta learning rule. Um, and this basically boils down to gradient descent, and at the end of the day, you can show that this whole procedure ends up being uh, a kernel regression problem again, with a kernel that's defined by the dot product of these representations. Okay, cool. And then ask the questions that I just uh, asked. So for example, we can ask if we can reconstruct the scenes that this animal was seeing. So in, the, in this animal was seeing the following, uh, these are examples of uh, pictures that this animal was seeing. So we're gonna look at this data and give it a bunch of examples and then try to train our uh, readouts and see if we can reconstruct it. So we did this in multiple ways. I'm just gonna tell you one, the result that comes out of it. So uh, one thing we did that was meaningful was, or came out, gave, gave some insight, was instead of rec uh, reconstructing the original, let's say, image, we took it and bandpass filtered it with several, uh, or several, several frequencies, and uh, basically tried to reconstruct, you know, high or low or mid sort of range frequency um, uh, portions or, 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 or filtered versions of the images. And long story short, what we find is basically that, I mean, it's much easier to reconstruct a low frequency uh, content of the uh, images from the, uh, from, the, from the data set or from the recordings than high frequency uh, portions. And basically, uh, and, and there's a belief that, or uh, there's a thought that, I mean, MMAs are very highly uh, visually not, not good and they rely on uh, very low level, uh, low frequency content of the world. So, so that, that was a biological sort of insight that came, came out of this. You can ask about other questions, for example, so here's again uh, some samples from the ImageNet data set this animal saw. For example, looking at this data, can we tell from this, uh, from this area 
whether, I mean, to tell between this class, I, I believe the class was birds and, I don't know, rodents. And it turns out, I mean, this code is terrible for this. So you can plot this um, uh, metric, the, the metric that I described, the uh, um, test model alignment. It's basically rising linearly, meaning that, I mean, uh, yeah, basically this, with few samples, you will not be able to uh, do this classification problem looking at this code. So basically, it also says that, again, verifies the intuition that primary visual cortex is mostly uh, um, basically for um, uh, low-level features like edges and so on and so forth, and to get basically to be able to learn from it these kinds of object-level uh, pictures or, or features is hard. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> so here's another uh, thing that, that this uh, um, uh, kind of kernel picture I mean, uh, pushed us to ask. So the one thing we noticed was basically, look, I mean, if everything depends on this kernel, which is the dot product, right? I mean, I can always rotate this Q by, 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 by these, these, these vectors by just some rotation matrix. And it just doesn't change the dot product, okay? I'm done? Two minutes, okay, so I'll, okay. Then, um, so the question is, I mean, why choose one code, code over the others? Is there a reason that among all the possible rotations that this um, um, one could choose, why, um, Biology chose one, but not the other ones. So here's a little experiment we did. So I'm going to skip the uh, explanation of just give it a result. What we did was basically um, we took the biological code and compared it to all its rotated versions. So these basically have the same uh, dot product kernel, meaning that our learning performance from that code is extremely okay. It doesn't change. However, if you look at the uh, total um, um, uh, spike count that, uh, that, that these different codes uses, biology is very different. So, so here are basically histograms of the total spike count of uh, all the randomly rotated versions of the biological code. And the, uh, the, vert the, true, the, the black line, vertical black line is basically biological code. And the vertical red dashed line is something where we optimize for uh, spike count. So it's basically we try to fit, you know, everything uh, keeping the kernel fixed. And basically, you know, these guys are like, like I don't know, 10 to the, like 100 standard deviations away from the uh, histograms that you get from the biological, so it's sort of random rotated uh, codes. So therefore, um, uh, so biology does something special about uh, trying to get um, efficiency. Okay, all right, so I've, what happened is basically what I thought would happen. So I end up talking about uh, one of these limits. And the problem with this limit is there's no representation learning. And, but if you want to study representations, then you have to find other limits that's, that's possible to study. Um, so one thing actually you can do is um, over, uh, so instead of finding a limit, you can look at these, uh, these metrics of um, um, test model alignment over to, uh, uh, over training in a, in a network not in this limit, and you'll find that basically this particular model alignment is increasing over time or across layers. But uh, so this is more of a descriptive study. Uh, but uh, so I'll just flash two uh, recent papers and then leave. So we have found two other limits where you can study representation learning, and which is analytic to trust, uh, tractable. So one is this paper. Uh, so this is a clear uh, paper from this year. So what this paper shows is that if you initialize a neural network from small initialization, you don't have to go to infinite width limit. It turns out that the descriptor of the neural network's learned function is not the initial tangent kernel, but the final tangent kernel. So of course, I mean, how do you get the final tangent kernel? You have to train the neural network, but yet there's still a match to a kernel machine, which has its own uh, properties. So I'll skip that. And the second one I want to highlight is this paper, which is just a uh, hit archive. So this basically shows a different kind of an infinite width limit where um, representation learning is possible. And we basically, uh, that includes in introducing a new parameter here, gamma, and taking that uh, parameter to infinity with network width. And so what we do is we take dynamical this, this, uh, gradient descent equations and pass it through the MSR formalism. There was a talk about dynamical mean field theory yesterday, similar formalism and then basically take infinite width limit, and at the end of the day show that the uh, evolution of all of these networks, uh, hidden layer uh, representations follow a stochastic process. 
And that stochastic process basically is very descriptive of the neural network's behavior. So I'll just show what's happening over here. This is training loss. At the top is the tangent kernel limit. So, and here is basically the representation learning limit. This dynamical mean field T is able to predict both. And here it's also showing basically that um, uh, the dynamical mean field T is also able to predict not just the losses, but also the, uh, the kernels, the, the uh, hidden layer kernels, which basically are showing representation learning uh, at the beginning and during and after training. So with that, uh, so this is a very recent work and uh, we haven't really uh, uh, used it to gain more insight. At this stage, I'm showing that there's theory and the theory is matching data. And, uh, uh, but I'm very excited about this particular one because I mean, uh, I think there's a lot to, I mean, there's a lot to study its phenomenology and get, get more insight into uh, representations and, and then what they reveal about uh, learn, learned features. Okay. So with that, I want to basically acknowledge uh, my group members, especially today's talk was uh, Alex, Blake, and Abdul's work and uh, my funding sources. And thank you very much and apologize for going over time. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. There was a lot of stuff in this, in this talk. Do we have some questions from, from the audience? Mario, let's start with you. Uh, thank you very much, very nice talk. I have a question, but uh, it's ba based on your introduction. You said that um, we think that uh, when, uh, when we are born uh, in our DNA, we have something that uh, allows us to have a brain that already is able to do some things. So do you believe that the, in the DNA, the, um, the wire connections are encoded in DNA? Or how is it encoded? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. Uh, again, this is of debate whether, for example, I mean, in one of the papers that I, I've written, tried to estimate the information content in, in the DNA and how much information would you need to specify all the connections and found the big gap and, and so on and so forth. But, we can argue whether that calculation is correct or not. But I mean, I guess the common, well, most believe that it's not the exact wiring uh, sort of um, that is coded, but some rules to develop the whole um, system to a level that, you know, it's ready to function with, with little training afterwards. So, so, so that, that's, that's, I think that's reasonable. Like the fingerprint is not encoded in the DNA, but there's like an, a rule that makes your skin create a yeah. fingerprint. Yeah, similar, similar ideas. Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? I was wondering when you showed these uh, plots on the, on, this, on the efficiency of the biological learning rules that you found, <clears throat> Sorry, do you think that you could, you could sort of maybe add some kind of energetic cost and then get efficient representations also with some gradient-based learning? Or do you think that these are really signatures of some, you know, alternative learning rule that somehow yields itself better to also, you know, metabolically efficient codes? Yeah, so it's a very good question. So you're asking whether these, so here I'm taking the given code and trying to say something about it, but then you're asking whether this arises from uh, a particular kind of training, yeah. Um, so uh, I believe, I mean, uh, um, yeah, so you, you could certainly um, uh, try to pen penalize not sparse codes during training and, and see if something like this arises. Yeah, certainly true. But you haven't tried it? No, we haven't tried this one yet. No. Okay. Okay, then let's thank Cengiz once again for his talk and for answering our questions. Recording stopped.